on World News Tonight. Sweeping floods. The UK battles waves engulfing streets and hospitals as severe weather overtakes the nation. Tropical threat. The Olympics disrupted with a brand new cluster amidst rising dangers of storms. Catching fire. Flames burn through the US with the blaze being battled despite destroyed infrastructure. Up, up and away. Visitors get a view of New Jersey from all the way up amongst the clouds in a peculiar vessel. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is the Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. A very good evening and thank you for joining with us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage with the outrageous burst from Mother Nature. In southern England, thunderstorms have caused flooding in the capital region, submerging roads, train stations and hospitals. Parts of the central line of the London Underground are still closed. Some experts believe this is another example of extremities brought on by climate change. On the ground, we have other than a world news special correspondent, Delini Senviratna, joining us now from London in the United Kingdom. Delini? Yes, Shanali. It just stopped raining here, but torrential rains are still making landfall in many parts of the UK. Parts of the central line in East London remain suspended as engineers work to repair the damage caused by heavy downpours the day before that flooded streets in London's east and north. Two London hospitals were also flooded and are urging people to visit other facilities instead. And a shopping centre in East London was hit by flash floods. The heavy downpours followed a heat wave earlier this week that brought days of record-breaking temperatures. Already less than two weeks earlier, rain had sent flash floods through West and South London, which left cars abandoned and homes evacuated. Other parts of Europe have also been seeing unusual weather this summer, with record-breaking heat at night. Climate scientists believe that rising average, um, average temperatures are likely to lead to more heavy rainfall across the globe. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was other than a World News Special Correspondent Dilini Senmi Ratna reporting from London in the United Kingdom. The Dixie Fire has engulfed an area the size of New York City, ripping apart more than a dozen homes and structures and threatening 10,000 more. Tonight, wildfire season in full force, way too early. The harbinger, Northern California's Dixie Fire, now torching an area the size of New York City, ripping apart more than a dozen homes and structures, threatening 10,000 more. It's very stressful, uh, scary at times. More than 5,000 firefighters on the front lines, struggling to contain the flames after the rapidly expanding footprint merged with the nearby fly fire into an unpredictable mega blaze. Crews across the West already stretch thin. Right now, 22,000 firefighters on the front lines of 85 major fires raging across 13 states. So far, more than 2.7 million acres have burned this year, outpacing this time in 2020, the worst year ever recorded by nearly a million acres. We still have to keep our head in the game because we still have the peak months ahead of us. In Oregon, the massive bootleg fire, the nation's largest, is now burning more than 400,000 acres and only 53% contained. It's so dry that a lot of this is just turning to dust. The sparks of a climate in chaos, igniting fears of another unprecedented year of devastation. Still in the U.S., President Joe Biden and Iraqi Prime Minister Mustafa al-Kadimi sealed an agreement formally ending the U.S. combat mission in Iraq by the end of 2021, more than 18 years after U.S. troops were sent to the country. President Biden today with Iraq's Prime Minister announced the end of an era, that the combat mission in Iraq is over again. Our shared fight against ISIS is critical for the stability of the region and our counterterrorism cooperation uh, will continue even as we shift to this new phase we're going to be talking about. It's the second time the U.S. has ended combat in Iraq after President Bush invaded in 2003 to overthrow Saddam Hussein, claiming he was developing weapons of mass destruction and kicking off a civil war. It took nearly eight years for the U.S. to declare the combat mission complete. America's war in Iraq will be over. 
then Vice President Biden, with President Obama welcoming back the last troops from Iraq. But with U.S. troops out, Iraq collapsed, becoming a safe haven for ISIS terrorists. So the U.S. went back in. Today, President Biden said that combat mission, Iraq II, is over. But this time, a few thousand U.S. troops will stay in Iraq in a support capacity and conduct counter-terrorist operations as needed. It's a very different picture in Afghanistan, where President Biden is fulfilling a deal signed by former President Trump to pull out nearly all troops by the end of August. The Taliban are already making rapid advances. Tunisian President Kai Saeed sacked the defense minister a day after ousting the prime minister and suspending parliament, plunging the young democracy into constitutional crisis in the midst of a pandemic. The sudden move by Tunisia's president to oust its prime minister, its government and freeze parliament with help from the army has left Tunisia in turmoil in what opponents are denouncing as a coup. <laughs> Those for and against President Kai Saeed clashed violently outside of Parliament Monday, with both sides appearing to throw stones. The country's largest political party, a moderate Islamist organization, has condemned the president's actions, which also include imposing a nightly curfew until August 27th. The president's dramatic moves follow months of deadlock and disputes, pitting him against Prime Minister Hisham Meshishi and a fragmented parliament as Tunisia descended into an economic crisis exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Meshishi on Monday responded by saying he cannot be a disruptive element and will hand over responsibility to whomever the president chooses. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki said the U.S. is concerned about the situation. We are in touch at a senior level from both the White House and the State Department with Tunisian leaders to learn more about the situation, urge calm and support Tunisian efforts to move forward in line with democratic principles. U.S. State Department spokesman Ned Price later said in a statement that the U.S. has been in contact with Tunisian government officials to stress that solutions to the country's problems should be based on its constitution. The United Nations is also urging restraint, and the European Union is asking all sides to respect Tunisia's constitution. Saeed invoked emergency powers on Sunday night, marching with tens of thousands of his supporters. President since 2019, he campaigned as a political outsider against what he said was a corrupt and incompetent elite. Saeed said the decision to oust Meshi Shi and suspend parliament for 30 days isn't a coup, but a constitutional and popular response to years of political deadlock and economic crisis, including high unemployment. South and North Korea have restored their hotlines as part of efforts by the two country leaders to rebuild strained ties. This comes 13 months after North Korea unilaterally severed it. North and South Korea have restored their previously severed hotline as the two countries' leaders agreed to rebuild ties and regain trust, Seoul's presidential blue house said on Tuesday. North Korean state media outlet KCNA also said that all inter-Korean communication channels resumed Tuesday morning, in line with the leaders' agreement. The Blue House said that South Korean President Moon Jae-in and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un made the agreement after having exchanged multiple letters since April. North Korea first severed the hotline last June as inter-Korean relations soured after a failed 2019 summit between Kim and former U.S. President Donald Trump, which Moon had offered to mediate. Moon has called for talks with the North and for the hotline to be restored, pinning high hopes on U.S. President Joe Biden to restart nuclear talks with Pyongyang. Tuesday's announcement came as the two Koreas marked the 68th anniversary of the armistice that ended the 1950-1953 Korean War. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back. Moving on now to the updates on the Tokyo Games. The dream has come true. In
even though the games have commenced, back-to-back -back disruptions have been pounding the games. In the latest row, there was a tropical storm that delayed the scheduled games for the day and the Olympics Village reports seven new COVID-19 cases. Tokyo Olympics organizers reported seven new games-related COVID-19 cases, including two athletes on Tuesday. Local news reported an Olympic tennis player from the Netherlands and 12 games security staff have tested positive for the coronavirus. That's despite setting up a bubble system at the Tokyo Games Village, where around 11,000 people are staying. It includes testing at the facility's border. The total count in the village since July 1st is 155 cases. Tropical storm Nepertark, hovering around Japan's east coast, is another headache for organizers. Wind and rain near Tokyo Bay delayed the start of the women's triathlon early in the morning, and also disrupted surfing, rowing, and archery medal events. Tokyo is forecast to receive nearly an inch and a half of rain over the next 24 hours, according to the Japan Meteorological Agency. Although facing delays, athletes could welcome a slight break from the extreme heat that had earlier caused an Olympic archer to collapse. Thailand reported a record number of coronavirus cases while Malaysia has notched up more than 1 million infections as the virulent Delta variant carves the deadly path through Southeast Asia, now a global epicenter for the virus. They come wearing protective equipment and bringing life-saving oxygen. But these volunteers are not medical professionals. In Bangkok, where hospitals are full and some 20,000 people remain in need of beds, volunteer groups have been risking their lives to help patients at home. Here they give oxygen to a 52-year-old woman. She and her sister lost their mother to COVID-19 last week. Thailand is registering some 15,000 new coronavirus cases each day as the Delta variant spreads through Southeast Asia. Only about 5% of the country has been fully vaccinated. In neighboring Malaysia, the total number of COVID-19 cases surpassed 1 million on Sunday. Malaysia has one of the region's highest number of infections per capita, but also one of its fastest vaccination rates. About 16% of the population is fully vaccinated, but as Delta spreads, locals say more urgency is needed. In Indonesia, the epicenter of Southeast Asia's outbreak, the number of deaths reported each day has been steadily growing, with over 1,500 recorded on Friday. With less than 7% of the population fully vaccinated, the Indonesian president said Sunday the government is adding more intensive care units and extending virus restrictions by another week. Now in the Middle East, Israel is considering giving a third shot of the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine to its elderly population even before FDA approval in order to help fend off the Delta coronavirus variant. More on this, let's cross over to other than our world news special correspondent, Christina Almeida, joining us now from Riyadh in Saudi Arabia. Christina. Yes, Shanali. US and EU authorities are considering whether booster shots are needed for specific risk groups. Israel began offering boosters to immune-compromised people this month on a case-by-case -case basis. Since the Delta variant began spreading in Israel in June, the health ministry has twice reported a drop in the vaccine's effectiveness against infection and a slight decrease in its protection against severe disease. A decision should be made in the coming weeks and it would likely affect people either 60 to 70 years old and up. The high-risk group first to get the jab when Israel began its vaccination drive. Some experts said Israel should wait a little longer to receive more information about safety and effectiveness of a third shot. Authorities were better advised to get the vaccine to those who have not been inoculated yet at all. Around 60% of Israel's 9.3 million population have been vaccinated. The cabinet is hoping that the vaccines will allow it to avoid costly lockdowns by protection to those most vulnerable to severe disease, even as infections climb. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was other than a world news special correspondent, Christina Almeida, reporting from Riyadh in Saudi Arabia. Cases are surging in the United States and increasing hospitalization rates are prompting U.S. local authorities to mandate wearing masks even for the vaccinated and maintain pandemic travel restrictions. 
The United States will keep in place all current COVID-19 travel restrictions for now due to concerns over the highly transmissible Delta variant. A White House official told the decision came after a senior-level administration meeting late last week amid a rising number of U.S. coronavirus cases. It's a signal that slowing vaccinations and rising cases are clouding the U.S. recovery. Adding to the mix is the new Delta variant. Virologists and epidemiologists told the Delta variant is the fastest, fittest, and most formidable version of the virus that causes COVID-19 the world has encountered. Experts said there is also mounting evidence the Delta variant can infect fully vaccinated people at a greater rate than previous versions, and concerns have been raised the vaccinated may even spread the virus. In the United States, which has experienced more COVID-19 cases and deaths than any other country, the Delta variant represents about 83 percent of new infections. So far, unvaccinated people represent nearly 97 percent of severe cases. The spreading Delta variant has led some municipalities to reimpose mask mandates and is upending expert assumptions about the path of the pandemic. The travel announcement almost certainly dooms any bid by U.S. airlines and the U.S. tourism industry to salvage summer travel by Europeans and others impacted by the restrictions. Airlines have heavily lobbied the White House for months to lift the travel curbs. The United States currently bars most non-U.S. citizens coming from the United Kingdom, most EU nations, China, India, South Africa, Iran, and Brazil. We have some good news for you. A mixed vaccination of first AstraZeneca and then a Pfizer COVID-19 shot boosted neutralizing antibody levels by six times compared with two AstraZeneca doses, a study from South Korea showed. A new medical study from South Korea says that a shot of the AstraZeneca coronavirus vaccine followed by a shot of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine can boost some antibody levels by six times compared to using just two shots of AstraZeneca instead. The findings from Korea's Disease Control and Prevention Agency follow a similar study in the UK last month. The studies would support the decision by several countries to allow people who've had a single shot of AstraZeneca to use an alternative for their second dose after AstraZeneca was linked to rare blood clots. It includes Canada, Italy and China, although the World Health Organization has warned against the practice, saying there isn't enough data about the health impact. The South Korea study specifically focused on levels of what are called neutralizing antibodies, which prevent coronavirus from entering cells and replicating. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Staff from a coronavirus care centre in Myanmar's current state moved beds and patients across flood waters amid flooding that has displaced hundreds of people in the country. The European Union is on course to hit a target of fully vaccinated at least 70% of the adult population by the end of the summer, given that percentage of those 18 and over have now received a first dose. The Cuban embassy in Paris said that its building has been attacked with petrol bombs causing serious damage to no injuries to diplomatic staff. A sandstorm as high as 100 meters engulfed northwestern cities in China. Dramatic footage released by Chinese media showed giant clouds of dust enveloping nearing cities which are both located on the fringes of the Gobi Desert. U.S. top disease expert Dr. Anthony Fauci wants to prepare vaccines for the next potential pandemic. The New York Times reported that Fauci suggested a project to produce prototype vaccines to project against 20 families of viruses. If funded, the plan would cost several billion dollars and take five years for the first results to be seen. And finally tonight, the 38th annual New Jersey Lottery Festival of Ballooning returned to Solberg Airport in Reddington, New Jersey. The event was cancelled in 2020 because of the coronavirus pandemic, but 2019's festival was hugely popular, attracting 170,000 visitors. The clear, sunny day and calm winds were ideal for flight as this year's visitors enjoyed food, fireworks, family activities and concerts. There were 100 different hot air balloons, including a New Jersey Lottery Summer Days balloons that shaped like the sun. Freeman said the festival is partnering with the New Jersey Department of Health, Wegmans Pharmacy and Hunterton Healthcare to offer the free COVID-19 vaccines. 
Those who get vaccinated will receive ticket discounts and be entered into a sweepstake for a chance to win a ride in the New Jersey lottery balloon. The New Jersey Division of Travel and Tourism says the annual festival is the largest summertime hot air balloon and music festival in North America. Well, that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shinali. Until then, stay safe and have a good night.